be alive. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online Lecture One Eighty One and Retina Session Thirty Three. Today we have with us Dr. Kim Ramaswamy sir, and he'll be talking on mechanisms of macular edema and diabetic macular edema, one of the very important topics. And I request Dr. Lalit Verma sir to please introduce Dr. Kim Ramaswamy sir. Lalitza, your audio, sir. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Rolika, uh, for this. And it's my privilege and honor to introduce uh, one of the doins uh, in retina in the country, uh, none else than Dr. Kim Ramaswamy, very dear friend for a couple of decades now. He's the head of retina services at the world-famous Arvind Eye Care System. Because Arvind Eye Care System is one of those systems who have a very disciplined, uh, you know, integrated approach to manage all these patients. And very proud feeling comes when you know Arvind System was the one of the systems, first system only listed in the Time magazine of the world, very you know prestigious magazine. So coming to Kim, Kim is an excellent uh, VR surgeon and uh, has special interest in diabetic retinopathy and DME. And was uh, first from India, I think, uh, to start teleophthalmology services. And also gave a very, you know, uh, uh, very proud to say that, that he tied up with the Sundar Pichai of Google fame mm -hmm. and Topcon to evolve one of the first world's first project on, uh, on AI in diabetes retinopathy. So uh, these are one of the few things which, uh, you know, uh, make us proud. He has uh, so many research papers, nearly 200. He has led the VRSI to its present state. Also, also uh, vice president of uh, Trauma Society and Lifetime Achievement Award at APAO, Best Doctors uh, and, uh, you know, Sudaria Oration Award. Red, Red Buckler, one of the very quoted awards for video, very, very competitive. And uh, he has, uh, you know, won that also in, in, uh, uh, in a film festival held in Canada. So we are very proud. We are very lucky that his host, uh, uh, Dr. Kim Ramaswamy, uh, and uh, Center for Sight actually is very privileged and the entire audience. So one of the world's best person to talk on DME. I have heard his talk so many times on diabetes macular edema at virtually all the states he has delivered even in AIUS. And conceptually, one of the, you know, the way he, you know, gives the talk, gradually, gradually increasing this, the, the complexity of the subject. Very, very nice and lucid talks uh, I have heard from Kim. So, Kim, you have with you around 40, 45, 50 minutes. And then we have, you know, uh, 10 uh, people who will keep questioning after that to clarify their doubts. Uh, uh, we call them hot seats. And these are privileged people who will, uh, you know, ask some questions after that, if time permitting, Ajit and me will also chip in. But, uh, but uh, over to you now to start your talk on DME and uh, macular edema. So you can start sharing your screen. Thank you, sir, for the generous uh, introduction. Uh, I wish all of them was true, but uh, thank you. So I, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Yeah, Kim, everything is visible and you are audible. Uh, so, at the outset, I want to thank uh, Dr. Santosh Shanavar and the entire team at CFS for giving me this opportunity in this prestigious PG update. This is the most sought after PG update uh, today. Uh, as I know, many of our own PGs uh, look forward to this. And so do some many of our fellows. So really, really, I congratulate the entire team, especially Dr. Santosh, for putting up this wonderful uh, uh, PG update, which is going to be so useful for everybody. So Santosh has asked me to talk about diabetic macular edema, uh, a very important topic. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. So today I'm going to talk about diabetic macular edema basically on its mechanisms and briefly on its management. As you all know, this is a recent publication from the International Diabetes Foundation which has shown that the prevalence of diabetic 
diabetes globally is about 537 million. Till last year, we were thinking it was around 460 or something, but it's very high. And what is important to understand is four out of every five diabetics live in low or middle income countries, which means there's a huge burden for these economically uh, low income and middle income countries. In India itself, there's a huge uh, change that's been happening over the last few decades. As you can see from this prevalence map, there's been an increasing prevalence of diabetes in the country. So today we have about 77 million people living with known people, known diabetics in our country. And this is projected to double in the next 25 years. So this is going to be a huge problem. But if you look at diabetic retinopathy, globally there are about 93 million people living with diabetic retinopathy of these 38 million people have sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy. When we say sight-threatening, it means either patients have diabetic macular edema or a proliferative disease, which is likely to bleed and cause blindness. Almost 2 million people are blind today from diabetic retinopathy. In India, if you look at the scenario of diabetic retinopathy, it is estimated that about 6 million uh, uh, diabetics in India have sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy. And if you look at diabetic macular edema prevalence, it's in the urban population, it is one out of every three diabetic retinopathy patients are having a diabetic macular edema. And in the rural area, it's one out of every five would be having diabetic macular edema, which means there's a huge public health challenge for the country and financial burden. So coming to diabetic retinopathy per se, there is... Uh, these are the few hallmarks of diabetic retinopathy, as you all know. Basically, you have microaneurysms, dot and blot hemorrhages, heart exudates, cotton wool spots, venous changes, erma, and other proliferative changes. The first visible sign that you would see in diabetic retinopathy is the presence of microaneurysm, which you see like a dot red like hemorrhage, uh, which is occurs due to the loss of pericytes. The, the blood vessels starts bulging. And it's an important differential diagnosis for a dot hemorrhage. Over a period of time, it appears and disappears in various locations. The other features are hard exudates, which are nothing but lipoprotein residues located in the inner nuclear and outer plexiform layers, or the dot and blot hemorrhages uh, that you see very often, or the cotton wool spots as it progresses further, which are nothing but uh, nerve fiber layer in Fox. So if you look at the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy, we all know it happens over a period of time when there's a, a hyperglycemia. There are various pathways such as the uh, sorbitol pathway or reverse glycation end product pathway or PKC activation, which results in damage to the pericytes, endothelial cells, and glial cells and causes a series of changes. Histopathologically, you see a thickening in the basement membrane. There's a loss of pericytes and damage to the endothelial cells. This causes the retinal vessels to change and slowly the retina becomes anoxic and you see all the uh, consequences of retina becoming anoxic. So now coming to our topic on diabetic macular edema, this is defined, def uh, defined as an abnormal increase in the fluid volume in the macula. The extracellular fluid can infiltrate the retinal layers and accumulate in cavities, which are commonly referred to as cysts. So you see these cystic changes that you would uh, see in diabetic, especially in the OCTs, which is not seen, may not be seen clinically on a fundus examination, but the OCT clearly shows this edema. So why is it important to recognize diabetic macular edema or identify diabetic macular edema? Because this is one of the leading cause of visual loss in diabetic patients who have diabetic retinopathy. The early treatment diabetic retinopathy study had clearly shown that the three-year risk of moderate visual loss in an untreated diabetic retinopathy is as high as 32%. So today, very good treatments are available when identified early. So early identification can lead to early treatment, which can prevent unnecessary loss of vision due to diabetic macular edema. So coming to what are the mechanisms, how diabetic macular edema happens? 
As you know, the blood retinal barrier, which is a complex structure with several components, such as the zonula octridentis, which is the tight junction between the endothelial cells, adherence junctions connecting the pericytes to endothelial cells, Mueller cells and astrocytes, which stabilizes the tight junctions between the endothelial cells. So diabetic macular edema is really a multifaceted dysregulation of the hemostasis that is present in the normal uh, structure of the retina. What happens here, there's an increased retinal fluid entry where in the intracellular junction alterations, loss of cells that constitutes the blood retinal barrier. So there's an increased trans endothelial transport. With that, there's an increased permeability you do uh, VEGF or uh, uh, platelet uh, growth factor pathway activation, pro-permeability mediator release, and pigment epithelium derived factors and other antipermeability factors that gets down-regulated causes increased permeability of fluid. In addition, you see these disorganization of the cytotypes, such as the loss of pericytes, which we are classically uh, talking about, loss of endothelial cells, and the RP morphological uh, or functional alterations that happens with time. Added to this is the inflammation that supersedes, which causes increased leukocytosis, increased circulation of the reactive oxygen species, activation of the innate immune cells, leading to pro-inflammatory mediators release. And in a, this, the role of Mueller cells, which gets affected because Mueller cells actually re regulate the retinal hemostasis, maintains the intra extracellular fluid balance and modulates the inflammatory response. I have a video that downloaded in this, which talks this about- This imbalance causes fluid to accumulate in the retina, resulting in intracellular and extracellular edema. Hyperglycemia causes oxidative stress that initiates activation of the retinal glial cells to produce a number of inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, TNF, and also VEGF. The upsurge of these cytokines attracts more cells migrating into the retina. Activated microglial cells proliferate and migrate into the subretinal space. As a result of abnormal transcellular channel formation in the diabetic retina, transcytosis of activated microglial cells is impaired and leads to accumulation of cells. The trapped microglial cells continue to produce inflammatory mediators that further amplify the inflammatory response and ultimately leads to disruption of the inner nuclear layer and neuronal cell death. Concurrently, the upsurge in inflammatory mediators and oxidative stress leads to dysfunction of the homeostatic control mediated by Muller cells. Cur 4.1 channels in the Muller cells are downregulated leading to reduction of transportation of potassium ions from the Muller cells. Continued uptake of potassium by Kerr 2.1 channels and osmotically coupled water molecules causes the cells to balloon, leading to intracellular edema and a loss of function of the cells. The intracellular swelling, edematous cyst formation, accumulation of extracellular fluid and damage to microvessels may result in neuronal degeneration and photoreceptor loss. In addition, altered tight junctions of the RPE cells that can occur in the diabetic retina may cause subretinal fluid to accumulate as a consequence of Starling's law. Microglial cells secrete cytokines, chemokines, and neurotoxins in response to endogenous triggers in the degenerating retina. These increase capillary permeability and further amplify the inflammatory response. Continual dysfunction of the blood retinal barrier allows leakage of fluid, proteins, and other macromolecules to leak into the retinal extracellular space, resulting in extracellular edema and macular thickening. I should thank Dr. Raji Raman from SN2 sharing this beautiful video, which explains how macular edema occurs. So there's a, it's a multifactorial things that happen, the inflammation and various other uh, dysregulation that happens leading to diabetic macular edema. That's about how diabetic macular edema occurs. And now we'll talk about how you classify diabetic macular edema based on various factors. The ETDRS, the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study, 
was the first one to classify diaptic macular edema. And subsequently, we have multiple other classifications based on all of you are familiar with this ETDRS definition of what we call as clinically significant macular edema, which we have seen where there's a thickening at or within 500 microns of the center of the fovea or hard exudates at or within 500 microns of the center if adjacent to a retina is thickened. And then thickening or one, I'm sure all the postgraduate this is the first thing you learn about diabetic macular edema. Today, uh, the International Clinical Classification of Diabetic Retinopathy, which was brought out by a group was, uh, initiated by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, brought in a simpler classification for easier understanding. And for diabetic macular edema, they said two levels. One is the presence of diabetic macular edema or absence. When there is no retinal thickening or hard exudates in the posterior pole, but you have other diabetic retinopathy changes, as you see here, then you call it as DME absent, but if retinal thickening or hard exudates are present in the posterior pole, then you call it as DME present. If DME is present, you classify it based on its severity, such as mild, moderate, or severe. Mild is when there is some retinal thickening or hard exudates in the posterior pole, but it is distant from the fovea. You call it as mild DME. If it is moderate, there's a retinal thickening or hard exudates approaching the center of the macula, but not involving the center. So here the visual acuity is still normal. Or if it is severe, there's a retinal thickening or hard exudates involving the center of the macula, which means that the visual acuity is already affected. So these are different classifications based on clinical classifications based on the presence of the edema in the different locations. Uh, so, what is the role of flu fundus fluorescein in angiography? Earlier, this was the only investigation which was done on all diabetic retinopathy patients. But today, with the advent of OCT, FFA's role has got limited, but it is still indicated in certain conditions, especially in diabetic macular edema, when you suspect macular ischemia, when there is unexplained visual loss or if you want to see a focal uh, macular edema and you want to treat this focally to guide uh, for guiding the laser treatment for focal laser, in, especially in non-center involving macula. And of course, when you have doubtful irma or new vessels in the dusk or elsewhere, or to identify the areas of capillary non-perfusion. Another condition which in normally in asteroid halosis, it's very hard to see uh, the fundus, you may miss a lot of findings, but when you do a fluorescein angiography, that's another indication to see the retina in a much better uh, uh, manner so that you are able to see or appreciate all the lesions. So the diabetic macular edema based on uh, fluorescein angiography, uh, angiography can be classified as focal when there is a focal leak that is happening around the macula or a diffuse leak uh, which is called as diffuse maculopathy or ischemic leak when there is an enlargement of the FAZ, uh, then you would call it as ischemic maculopathy. Ischemic maculopathy occurs as a result of non-perfusion of the parafoveal capillaries with or without intraretinal fluid accumulation. The macula usually appears relatively normal. The capillary, there is capillary non-perfusion, as you can see, that is altered or broken. And the patient usually has a very poor visual acuity. So the hallmark is the enlarged uh, FAZ, foveal avascular zone, and the macular CNP areas are seen as uh, signs of macular ischemia. Then based on the OCT uh, morphology, we can classify the optic macular edema into various types or the presentation, what we call a cystoid macular edema, when you see these cystic changes in the, in the uh, macular area or uh, when you have a diffuse thickening. Uh, this all implies or in, is important to understand when you're choosing the way how you treat these patients. A serous macular detachment, when you have a serous detachment where there's a fluid, a collection of the subretinal fluid in these patients, or a mixed type as you see here, cystic with the subretinal fluid changes. And in some patients, you see these stark posterior hyaloid which is again, could be a, a reason for macular edema. So we call this as a tractional or non-tractional uh, diabetic macular edema here. 
you are seeing a case with cystic changes. You see all these hard exudates and diffuse elevation of the, uh, the macula. This is a non-tractional diaptic macular edema, whereas in these all these three pictures that you see here in the OCT, you clearly see an elevation of the macula with a, uh, with a membrane, which is causing uh, traction over the fovea. Whatever way you treat these patients with focal laser or uh, the VEGF, they are unlikely to respond until you, this is a clear indication of surgically removing this tractional membrane to release this traction and so that the retina or the macular structure can uh, reform, the anatomical structure can be restored. So in the EM, DM, uh, diaptic macular edema, we have certain OCT biomarkers. There are many, I'm just, uh, for easy understanding, just few of them. The most important is the size of the central subfield thickness. The other two is the drill, that is the disorganization of the retinal inner layers and the hyperrefractive dots. These are some things that have come new in the recent times, which is gaining importance as a biomarker. If you see the central subfield thickness, the central area, which is the one millimeter in the ET or a circle or the central uh, around the fovea is what we call as the uh, central subfield thickness. Any changes happening within this area is indicative of the visual acuity changes, or it also talks about it indicates the increase in severity of diabetic retinopathy and also decrease in the uh, best corrected visual equity. Increase or decrease in the CST from baseline is definitely a good predictive biomarker of BCVA and response to anti-VEGF. This is what we look at when we are treating these patients on the periodical follow-up. Based on the increase or decrease in the thickness, you plan for the next uh, phase of treatment for these patients. Drill is an, another indicator, which is the disorganization or destruction of the cells within the inner retinal layers, that is the bipolar or the macron or horizontal cells, where you see the no, normal uh, layers of the retina that gets disorganized. It indicates disruption of the pathways that transmit visual information from the photoreceptors to the ganglion cell. So there's a lot of a loss of boundaries between the layers of the retina. It also indicates there's a chronicity of the diaptic macular edema. The visual equity improvement as DIL improves is a marker for therapeutic trial. So you see, as you see here, it's like you don't see any layers. And so DRIL has a greater correlation with the visual equity than any other OCT parameters. The third one is the hyperreflective foci or these dots, what we call as hyperreflective dots that you can see here. These are much smaller than the hard exudates. These are well circumscribed dots visualized in OCT in all the retinal layers, uh, uh, more often in the inner layers. These are lipid extravasations uh, or uh, aggregates of retinal inflammatory cells, what we call as activated microglia, and sometimes the degenerated photoreceptor cells which gets formed here. So the uh, multiple, the presence of multiple uh, uh, hyperreflective dots suggests tissue disintegrity, representing more severe diaptic macular edema, again associated with poor visual acuity. So these reflective foci are responsive because it indicates more of inflammation. They often respond better to corticosteroids than with anti-VEGF. So as biomarkers, uh, OCT. Uh, uh, is a very good imaging biomarker for diaptic macular edema. As this is the hallmark of uh, a, or an indication as to how your treatment is being responded to by the eye. Uh, when you look at the OCT, well, the central subfield thickness, which is the most commonly used indicator or biomarker in all the clinical studies where you're doing pharmacological studies or whatever laser, the CST is the indicator for it. The drill, uh, hyperreflective foci, continuity of the uh, external limiting membrane, integrity of the ISOS junctions are often robust predictors of visual equity in diabetic macular edema. So the another important investigation that plays a major role uh, today is the OCTA or uh, uh, OCT angiography as we call it which clearly shows it's a non-invasive. You're used to fluorescein angiography, which delineates the presence of the, the uh, blood vessel integrity is 
seen with fluorescein angiography today with the non-invasive procedure by just taking the OCTA, it shows the different vascular structures in the retina, but I won't go into the mechanisms of how OCTA works, but it is to say that OCTA delineates non with, through a non-invasive procedure. It is able to differentiate the different layers of the retinal bed vessels, as you can see here, the different slabs of the superficial vascular complex, which is shown here, the earlier one, or the deep vascular uh, plexus, as you can see, as you go deeper, the inner uh, retina, the whole retina is seen here, the outer retina, as you go further deeper, is seen uh, in different layers and the choriocapillaries are also delineated. Any abnormalities in these layers in the macular area, we would be able to identify early on without doing any fluorescein angiography. So this has become a very important tool, a non-invasive tool to identify early changes or even for treatment uh, progression in, uh, in diabetic retinopathy and in various other conditions. So even in OCTA, if you see sequentially, you're able to see the enlargement of the FAZ over a period of time in the different stages of diabetic retinopathy. Very often the uh, deep capillary plexus seems to be more reliable to predict the uh, ischemic maculopathy than the superficial uh, capillary plexus. As you can see here, this is the superficial capillary plexus. Whereas in the deep capillary plexus, you are able to predict the uh, presence of ischemia more uh, accurately than with the superficial capillary plexus. So that's about how you would investigate uh, diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema in brief. So the most important uh, investigation to be done is to, uh, uh, apart from the systemic uh, control or systemic, uh, systemic uh, uh, blood tests that you would do, the more important ocular investigation is to do an OCT and the, identifying the different uh, biomarkers that may be present in, uh, in uh, adaptive macular edema. So it is very important to look at these changes that happens in OCT, not looking at it in a very superficial manner. You need to measure over a period of time what is the central subfield thickness, how it is changing over a period of time, and thus would be a guide for how you decide on further treatment. When you come to the management of diabetic retinopathy, the gold standard still remains is the systemic control. You can't overlook this. This is a very important factor that is to do, uh, to evaluate the systemic control. That is the three most important factors that you would look at is the, how the blood sugar is being controlled, hyperglycemia, various studies would have shown over a period of time how these happen. Uh, I mean, how uh, hyperglycemia uh, is uh, 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 makes the changes or how it is uh, making the different pathological changes that happens uh, in diabetic retinopathy. The other important one is the uh, uh, hypertension the increase in hypertension, how it can significantly affect the presence of diabetic retinopathy. And more importantly, the serum lipids it has been shown in various studies uh, controlling the serum lipids uh, or improves the diabetic macular edema in, in many situations. So it has it is very often associated with increase in diabetic macular edema or increase in heart exudates in the macular area. So that cannot be underestimated at any point. So any time when the patient is come, coming for evaluation and treatment, these are the three important factors that we need to evaluate. And the other factors are anemia and, uh, uh, and the renal status of these patients have to be evaluated to ensure your treatment on the local region. Whatever you're treating is only locally to the ocular structure, but you're not treating the systemic cause, which is the etiology for diabetic retinopathy to happen. So it is very important that we look at that. So when it comes to diabetic macular edema, uh, today the anti-VEGF uh, is the treatment uh, of choice in uh, diabetic macular edema, uh, especially in center involving macular edema, as you see here, anti-VEGF uh, drugs are the treatment of choice or the intravitreal injections are the drug of choice. 
and in some cases uh, for still uh, laser predominantly plays an important role in non-center involving macular edema because this is a one-time treatment where you can prevent the macular edema whereas uh, anti vegfs are these patients need recurrent treatment and recurrent follow up so for the anti vegf therapy there are any number of trials have been uh, conducted to prove the importance of uh, anti vegf in the treatment of macular edema uh, many of you may not be aware of the drcr.net which is a group diabetic retinopathy clinical research network which was established uh, as a uh, as a multicentric clinical trials in the us by the nei national eye institute to conduct multiple studies uh, uh, involving multiple centers on the management of diabetic retinopathy and that is why this group of drcr.net was present and they have multiple protocols meaning multiple clinical studies on diabetic retinopathy uh to understand so we are going to talk about a few of them today because this is what gave us the guidance to how we could use uh these anti vegf agents in various situations today we have multiple drugs that are available such as ranibizumab bevacizumab and evacliprocept and so today the anti vegf is the gold standard for diabetic macular edema so simple a condition like this before treatment with such a diffuse macular edema with very often even with one single injection the patient responds so beautifully the normal anatomical structure is restored and the patient is able to gain vision but does it persist does it remain it doesn't usually the edema recurs based on the other conditions such as the metabolic status and the other associated factors in the retina so what are the drugs that are available today for treatment is uh, uh, these are the three most commonly used the first one to come was uh, lucentis uh, the ranibizumab which was the first approved drug it's an antibody fragment a very small compound which was uh, brought in uh, as lucentis in 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 the us and then subsequently across available across and post that Uh, the evastin was identified as a equally effective drug that is a monoclonal antibody which is effective in or used in the treatment of colorectal cancer in a very low dose uh, this was identified to have a, as good an effect or an anti vegf effect in the eye and so this became a much popular drug mainly because of the cost of this drug which was almost like uh uh one fiftieth or one hundredth of the lucentis when it was introduced so world over almost 70 to 80 percent of the injections that are given became evastin in a very short period of time but for a long period of time this is a very large uh, uh, monoclonal antibody it had a slightly less effectivity or limitations compared to lucentis and since it was then it was not approved by any uh, country as a, uh, a, a drug of choice or drug or uh, indicated drug in in uh, in diabetic macular edema or other conditions it was always used as an off label drug and uh, but in the recent times many uh, countries have started uh, uh, using evastin or labeling evastin as a uh, uh, drug indicated in uh, diabetic macular edema and in other uh, situations uh, but even who has shown this as one of the essential drug in its list of essential drugs uh, in its uh, in the website you would be able to see this the third drug the ilia or what we call as aflibercept it's a fusion protein it binds the vegf a with higher affinity than bevacizumab and ranibizumab and seems to have a slight edge over the other two drugs but again the cost of the drug is quite prohibitive for everybody to use these drugs so how did this come into effect there have been lot of studies i'm going to just talk about a very few of them just for you to know and it's very important for you to have these in your uh, because these comes as an exam questions in many a times where uh, you know how these drugs started coming into a regular practice 
the Lysol ride and rise study uh, for ranibizumab was some of the early studies which showed the effectiveness of uh, ranibizumab in improving the best corrected visual acuity and is well tolerated in diabetic macular edema. It reduces the risk of further vision loss and improved macular edema in patients with diabetic macular edema. Till the, uh, this drug was introduced, we had only laser as the treatment of choice. And as you all know, laser is a destructive procedure. And it was only to arrest the further development of diabetic macular edema and not to improve visual acuity. Whereas the introduction of these anti vegf drugs dramatically changed the scenario. And you are now able to improve the visual acuity in these patients. The protocol I, another very important uh, study done by the uh, DRCR net which showed that ranibizumab uh, uh, is uh, either doing a, a, a focal or grid laser at the time of giving these injections is no better than just differing the laser. Whether you do to give the laser along with ranibizumab or not, it doesn't seem to have a beneficial effect. So there was no need to start these patients with both laser and uh, ranibizumab. Uh, the bevacizumab or uh, another, the, the Avastin, as we call uh, uh, normally, is, is a drug, again, was with various studies. One of the important studies was Bold study, which supported the use of bevacizumab in patients with uh, uh, diabetic macular edema. Aflibercept, the Darwincy, uh, the Vista, and Vivid, all these studies showed that uh, the VEGF drug or the Aflibercept improved uh, visual acuity uh, compared to the macular laser in diabetic macular edema. And this was maintained for a longer period of time. Also, the aflipercept seems to be prolonged in its action in the eye, almost lasting for six to eight weeks, while the other two last for about close to four weeks. So we need to repeat these drugs. Another DRCR protocol, a very important uh, protocol T, this is a very important protocol which compared the efficacy of all the three uh, available anti of injections such as the aflibercept, bevacizumab, and ranibizumab. And the, all the three, when studied, were effective and relatively safe in the treatment of diabetic macular edema. But it also showed that the, the effectiveness depended on the baseline visual acuity. When the initial baseline visual acuity was all, less, there was very little difference among the three group, groups. But if the patient started with a lower level of visual acuity, which is poor visual acuity, the aflibercept seemed to have a slight edge over the other two drugs, uh, that is the ranibizumab and the bevacizumab. So there was no difference in the ocular safety profile across these three arms. While in patients with good visual acuity, the protocol V, now if a patient presents with macular edema but still has a uh, 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 very good visual acuity that is 6-9 or better, is it good to treat? It, this study showed that there is no significant difference whether you observe these patients over a period of time or you initially manage these patients with laser or aflibercept. cell. So it is, it's enough to observe these patients and treat them when there is change in visual acuity is what the protocol we brought out. Today we have multiple biosimilars that are available following the, uh, the uh, introduction of uh, these drugs like the ranibizumab. Today in India, we have multiple drugs like the Intas has brought out the Razumab. There is uh, the other drug by Reliance, Renizuril, and few other companies like Cipla is bringing. So today they are available at a lower cost compared to the parent molecule that is the Lucentis, though their cost is also much lower. Today, uh, because of these uh, biosimilars that are available, but you have to remember the generate drugs are usually stable because they are generated through a fixed chemical formula and synthesis. Whereas the biosimilars, we need extra caution. We need to have enough studies to understand their stability. Also, the immunogenicity study is very important and it can be an issue with biosimilars as we have experienced in the past due to the different living cells that are used and the processes followed by the different biosimilar developers. But they, they are very good, but you have to be aware of how these are brought into the market. 
steroids, another major player in, in the management of diabetic macular edema, which stabilizes the blood retinal barrier, down-regulates the uh, VEGF, especially when you have more inflammation, you would prefer using steroids. The IVTA, the intravitreal tramcinol or acetonide is a long-acting drug, which is indicated, uh, which is the like steroids are usually indicated in refractive diabetic macular edema where the patient is not responding to any of the anti of drugs. If there is a patient who has had a recent cardiovascular accident and often in post-vitrectomized eyes because these anti of drugs can be absorbed much faster whereas these drugs would remain in the eye for a longer period of time. But you have to understand these uh, steroids are associated with uh, side effects such as increase in intraocular pressure or the development of cataract in fakic patients. The Ozodex is another uh, dexamethasone implant which is widely used, which has much better safety profile compared to the intraarterial transnodal or acetonide given as a single implant. As you can see, this implant inside the vitreous cavity in front of the eye. This stays in the eye and uh, remains and is effective for almost a period of about three months. So it has its own indications, especially when you have inflammatory situation or increased subretinal fluid, you probably would prefer using steroids in diabetic macular edema. But what are the complications of diabetic macular edema? I mean, sorry, complications of using anti vegf injections is the common is the subconjunctival hemorrhage. Often you may have a transient raise in intraocular pressure. Endophthalmitis is a dreaded complication. You may end up with vitreous hemorrhage or, uh, or a retinal detachment. And of course, accidental uh, cataracts have been reported earlier on. The gold standard treatment, which we were all used to, is the laser uh, treatment. It can slow down the progression of diabetic retinopathy and stabilize the vision. The focal laser still useful in conditions where there's a non-center involving uh, macular edema, where you can treat these patients focally uh, uh, by causing endovascular thrombosis and occlusion of the macular edema. You would use an yellow laser or a green laser uh, in these patients. This is just a picturesque uh, representation of uh, how the laser, uh, the microorganisms are treated, but this doesn't happen as dramatically as shown in this animation. This is just to, for you to understand how this is targeted and why when this, the fluid kind of disappears. It doesn't happen so dramatically. But uh, grid lasers, uh, uh, very rarely used for diffuse macular edema, we tend to use uh, anti vegf injections. But in some cases where the edema is uh, outside or, or beyond outside the macular area, you can uh, you do a grid pattern laser in these cases or patients who are not responding to uh, anti vegf injections, still grid laser could be a savior in these patients. The laser complication, there's a usual transient increase in edema. The patient may have a parasitical scotomas, uh, intermittent foveal burns, and subretinal fibrosis or choroidal neovascular membranes are rare. So what are the prognostic factors in the adaptive macular edema is the baseline visual acuity when we start, duration of the adaptic macular edema, the ocular environment, and local pathological changes. Of course, the systemic status is very important. And as I said earlier, the retinal morphology, that is such as the drill, is important. This is just to show how uh, anti of treatment can help in improving the uh, anatomical structure. When a patient who is refractory to uh, anti of gets uh, often, we see a very good improvement with use of steroids in these patients. The other drug which has been recently approved by FDA is a, is a Fasibamap. It's still yet to come into the market in India. Various trials have shown its efficacy. Uh, it's an anti vegfa and anti-angioprotein 2 uh, molecule, which is effective both in uh, AMD and in uh, adaptic macular edema. We have to see clinical trials more on this. The various novel treatments, I just didn't want to go into the details of it, but many are being or out there in the horizon. We may see this coming up. The brolizumab, which is already there, uh, has been approved for, uh, for uh, DME, but has its own limitations. So it's used as a selective drug, but there are various drugs that are out there. So we may see 
the newer drugs that come into the uh, for uh, use in diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. So this is just to give you a brief glimpse of of how uh, an algorithm for diabetic macular edema management, when there is no visual loss, uh, we just observe these patients, though you see clinically some diabetic macular edema, if the patient has visual acuity is good, you would probably observe these patients. And those who have a non-center involved macular edema, you could still try a, a focal laser treatment in these patients. But if you have a central macular edema in these patients, and you see that these patients had a cardiovascular accident, you probably would be better off with the, using a corticosteroids. And if the patient has uh, uh, no uh, contraindications such as a recent cardiovascular uh, problem, uh, you could try the anti-VEGF injections as the first line of treatment. And in pseudophagy guys, you can still uh, try corticosteroids in these patients especially because they have a prolonged treatment uh, period. In fakey guys, anti-VEGF is the treatment of choice. And if they do not respond, then we would probably try corticosteroids. In vitrectomized eyes, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we would still uh, do use corticosteroids. When a patient presents with a tractional macular edema, the drugs usually do not play a major role. And you end up with uh, operating on these patients, doing a pass plan of vitrectomy, removing this traction so that the normal anatomical structure can be restored. So with this, in summary, we need to ensure that we identify this early on. This is most often a clinical diagnosis, as you've seen, but OCT is essential to prognosticate or uh, to identify the severity levels. It needs a good metabolic control, early identification, early treatment will help. And there are so many new drugs in the horizon that we will soon see uh, being used so I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Mukti Krishnan, Dr. Chitranjan, and Dr. Raji Raman from SN, who helped me with the slides in this. So I would stop here, and uh, sorry if I exceeded my time. I was not sure whether I... No, uh, Kim, you were well in time. In fact, uh, one of the most uh, lucid talks on uh, DME ever heard, because it's a long thing, and to summarize it in 35, 40 minutes, is an art by itself, which uh, you only could do, actually. And the way you, you know, uh, built up the story of pathogenesis and everything, I think it made very, very easy task for everybody to understand, including, including us, the pathogenesis, the inflammatory markers, the OCT, the FA, clinical classification, and all the, you know, components of, uh, of uh, lesions, and then gradually built up to anti-VEGF, and you didn't leave behind Farsimab also, uh, which has very, very recently been approved by FDA. And uh, the last chart actually summed up all, which a chart I think uh, must be remembered by each and every person, especially the postgraduates who are hearing. And maybe we could, you know, have a replica of this chart to be put up in all the, you know, uh, clinics for us to mug it up actually. The sentinel volume, non sentinel volume, tractional, non tractional, when steroids, when anti VEGFs. Wonderful talk, I must say. I can go on and on. Each slide was so much informative. So without going into much uh, you know, uh, uh, discussion by us, I would love to have the, 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 the front uh, 10 people who have already, you know, before your first slide, only the questions started coming up. That is what I noticed here. Before the first slide, when Kim was introducing the topic, you see, uh, I was very happy to see uh, these uh, you know, people. Sony, uh, I don't know whether she had already read so much about it and she came. That and, is last uh, class. Last yeah. class, it's already... So because I think you started at 8, 10 yeah. p.m. He, she started at 8, 0, 7 p.m. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's, let's uh, you know, uh, because time is very less, uh, came with us. So first question with Sony is uh, to be answered by Dr. Kim. When moderate NPDR with micronisms and hemorrhages with hard exudates, how should we describe the AV ratio of blood vessels? Uh, usually in the early stages, the AV ratio is not altered so much as you, yeah. uh, you would see. It's only in the early, later stages that you start seeing those changes, significant changes in the AV ratio. So early stages... Uh, it, yeah, absolutely, I agree. I, I agree because unless patient has concomitant hypertension or renal hypertension, once the nephropathy occurs, 
then I think AV changes may be important. But otherwise, uh, you see, uh, uh, then let's uh, go on to further because a lot of questions are there. And the second question, second question by the same person, why anemia aggravates GR? Because you mentioned three things, but you uttered two more, that is uh, anemia and kidney status. So I think Sony caught that and why anemia aggravates? So what happens in anemia, there's already an ischemia that's happening because the blood carrying capacity is very low. So in these... The oxygen patients, carrying capacity. Yeah, yeah. Oxygen carrying capacity. Oxygen carrying, carrying capacity of the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is less, so the oxygen carrying capacity is less. So the retina is relatively hypoxic in diabetics. Uh, the anemia will further aggravate the hypoxia. That's why there will be a deterioration of uh, changes because of diabetic retina. Yeah, Sony, you should remember that diabetic retinopathy is because of ox uh, hypoxia. Hypoxia, so in anemia, because hemoglobin comes out, so obviously the, the, it will aggravate. And next question uh, by Dr. Kavya is, uh, which I think was addressed, why young diabetic, basically I think she is pointing to IDDM patients, have to be aggressively treated for PRP, although not the domain of this lecture, but I think uh, we can answer since uh, this question has been raised. Ajit, can you throw light on this? Yeah, uh, this already we have uh, dealt with in the last yeah. class that all the IDDM patients where uh, the fibrosis and the severe uh, proliferative changes, they progress very fast compared to uh, type 2 diabetes. That's why uh, last class we suggested that when you see the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you start the treatment early and be aggressive with this. You see, absolutely correct, Ajit. Young diabetics, believe me, are, are you know, in young diabetics, the progression to a HRC, P P PDR, is very fast within, uh, you know, a couple of five years or so. And they have to be, therefore, aggressively treated by PRP in such situations. And fibrotic so, changes are much more in uh, IDDM patients. Yeah. Other IDDM. question by Dr. Meenal is, when do we label patient as, because you mentioned as, you see uh, diabetic hypertension and lipids and other co complicating. So a lot of people I have seen, I think uh, this question by Meenal is very relevant, that we say diabetic retinopathy, hypertension retinopathy. Sometimes we say mixed retinopathy, that diabetic hypertension, both. So when do we label patient as mixed retinopathy, uh, Dr. Kim? Yeah, when do you when you see the changes that are there, you know, typical diabetic retinopathy changes and typical hypertensive retinopathy changes. So, what are the hypertensive retinopathy changes that you would see? Is you know those scattered uh, flame shaped hemorrhages that you see, and more importantly, the AV changes that you would see in the blood vessels. That's very significant in the so in in the presence of both, you would call it as a mixed mixed retinopathy. Absolutely. So other question which is coming up because you raised a very important issue of biosimilars and costing also you touched upon like one in uh, 40 times more expensive. So Dr. Soini Mashru, what is the caution because you mentioned about immunogenicity and other things. So she apparently has not understood correctly. He says, what is the caution with biosimilars? Please, please explain again. See, these biosimilars are prepared based on the the different uh, processes that is used in developing. Though the final molecule is there, there is what is called as a parent uh, formula that they have. And then subsequently, each company has different uh, way of preparing this molecule. Yeah. So, so not... Tony, what is there is that you see there is an innovative molecule which uh, came in the form of Lucentis, Rani Museum of Lucentis. And Lucentis has a patent for 20 years. 20 years, they have monopoly to sell it all across the globe. Okay. And once this uh, patent is expiring, then, uh, then this Rani Museum can be manufactured by any company which has the, uh, you know, uh, sufficient manufacturing capacity. Like in India, in Ahmedabad, Intas was the first uh, people in the world, actually, who manufactured biosimilar, which Kim had uh, told about Razumab. And the caution is because the manuf they are biosimilars. They're not same. They're not same. You see, they're similar to the innovative. They're not same. So hence the question of immunogenicity comes. Even for biosimilar approval, they have to conduct study for it to be approved by the DCGI or the FDA authorities. And then only the biosimilars can be marketed. And then we conduct phase four trials also after that. And the reason, uh, you know, we have to exert caution is because, uh, because of the uh, manufacturing processes may have an issue. Therefore, inflammatory uh, you know, reactions 
in the initial phases may sometimes i remember when razoom app came into the market lot of people used to have inflammatory issues which used to resolve but but they rectified it uh, very well and it was only the fourth or fifth batch they had this issue after that uh, there has been no issue at all in fact uh, like kim was saying not only inta today sipla and uh, reliance and uh, you know sun pharma they are all coming up with by the chief advantage being affordability affordability is a very big issue uh, everywhere not only in india and because of the same reason uh, kim very nicely said 67% of the entire world still depends on an bevacizumab because it is a very very cheap molecule we will not go into the issue of why bevacizumab did not you uh, get fda approval and all such things but that is the issue i hope uh, you have understood next question by dr rajneesh singh is uh, i think this has been answered very well but still what is the credited criteria to say centrin volume and non centrin volume metallurgy this is a very relevant question uh, i think rajneesh because we have to differentiate non centered dive dme means you can use laser as the as the choice of treatment whereas once center is involved center means like kim said 1 mm of that uh, circle kim can you please uh, explain again yes sir you want me to show the slide or yeah maybe if, if it's better that you show because i think rajneesh will understand better sorry share can again you? yeah 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 Oh, yeah. Because it is important that we make these people understand yeah. about the CI and non-CI. Yeah. Because in the last chart also you said this. No, but uh, the yeah. picture is more important. Yeah, that is the reason I am requesting. Yeah, you see, Rajneesh, now you see here. It is just a chart, है ना? So one millimeter, three millimeter, and six millimeter. So once the one millimeter inner circle is involved, as Kim is indicating, then we say it's a center involving DME. and this results in visual loss no kim yes sir if you place the grid the etdr is grid over the central fovea that area is called as a central uh, area yeah. so anything in that we would call it as central involvement so rajneesh i hope you have understood this and uh, you will follow this uh, very clearly so a couple of more questions uh, uh, rolika you will have to permit today because there are a lot of questions coming up so uh, i would not uh, so other, other question other question is because you mentioned that anti vegfs are the gold standard kim and you had cut out lasers ek horror pen se aapne kaat diya na refractory dme after how many doses of anti vegf can be label as refractory dme and go for steroid so usually we would try uh, using anti vegf for one or two injections if there's no response we probably switch over to a different anti vegf not all the anti vegfs are uh similar so we try to use a different anti vegf for which the patient may respond if the patient does not respond to three again it depends on each individual uh, retina specialist uh but usually after three or four injections if the patient is not responding we would probably uh, resort to using steroids but again steroids by itself it uh, could be an indication based on like i was talking about the anatomical Yeah. Differences where there's you suspect more inflammation, you probably would use steroids in those situations. So, uh, so Dhuvya, Divya, there are some situations like pseudophagic eyes, OCD biomarkers, which Kim Mirren said, where we may prefer as your first line also. But once we have started the patient in a phagic eye or otherwise also, we started with anti vegfs. So, how many doses? There's no one answer to it. most of us believe three doses actually three doses yes three doses most of us believe in vrsa survey was carried out so they believe three doses but some people like bressler uh, uh, you know in us he says six doses six, six, yeah. so yeah i know so this is somewhere between 3 and 6 but by and large the threshold for shifting from anti vegf to steroids is decreasing because you see maximum response of anti vegf should come in one or two injections but we still gave Three doses to make it call as refractory DME, and then shift to either same uh, you know class that is different anti VEGF or a different class of drugs which is steroids. And within steroids, uh, you have written IVTA, but most of us try for dexamethasone because of the the safety profile is better. Okay. Yes, sir. So other question which is coming up is uh, you know vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, let me read this. Uh, uh, as a complication yeah is a complication it is so how to identify recognize 
So, uh, so what he's asking is vitreous hemorrhage, once you give anti-VEGF, is it because of anti-VEGF or is it because of PDR already existing? Yeah, so, uh, it's not a very difficult thing. Uh, you know, by and large in PDR, we rarely give anti-VEGF as first line. Although I know there are protocol, uh, you know, available where people are trying to push anti-VEGF also. But most of us do not, do not uh, prefer anti-VEGF as first line in PDRs. And how to recognize uh, uh, whether it's a complication uh, uh, of uh, anti-VEGF? By and large, you see, anti for vitreous hemorrhage to occur, PVD has to pull on a front. You see, how does uh, bleed occur? P bleed occurs primarily because of occurrence of PVD. PVD will pull on a front if it is existing in PDR, or it will pull on some capillary if it is a non-PDR patient. The other question, which is why is why in vitreous eye steroid should be choice, Kim? Yeah, in, usually in uh, you know the vitreous axis is scaffold. It, when you are doing it in a vitreous eye, the drug that you inject will get absorbed or removed much. from the eye much faster. So the time duration for it to be effective is much lower. Whereas the steroid, because the long-acting steroid, it remains in the eye for a longer period of time to have any effective change or on the diaptic macular edema. That's why you would probably prefer using steroids in those cases. So absolutely. You see, last two questions coming up now. Any cutoff to say what is enlarged FAZ? Any, uh, normally, like even if you look at the FAZ, there's a, the entire blood circulation, if you enlarge them and see, you have a complete circle. There's no breakthrough in the, in the, circle that is there of this. But anything more than uh, 500 to 400 and above uh, microns of uh, the size or of little more than a disc diameter, that means you're looking at a uh, macular ischemia in those cases. So Divya, the definition given is actually uh, more than 350, but they, they have correlated the size and the irregularity also. But I remember, Kim, that if it is more than 1,000, it is 1, absolute 1,000, yeah. 1,000 so is absolute. Yeah. Uh, 1,000 is Kim, absolute deleterious. What, uh, Kim has told is very right, that if yeah. the, uh, uh, the capillary network around the FAZ is regular, then 1,000 is abnormal. Yeah. But if it is broken, even if less than 1,000 also, it is ab considered abnormal. Yeah. So what I remember, uh, you know, having read a long time back, 1,000 is definitely correlated with very poor yes, visual yes, equity. Yes. There's a correlation. I know there has been 350, 500, and 1,000. So 1,000 were definitely correlated with poorer visual equity. Apart from that, what Ajit and Kim said, it is the irregularity also. It is not only the size circular, but irregularity also that you have to keep in mind. It's not only the absolute size. But uh, uh, last question, which is there now is, uh, everybody has praised Dr. Kim to you so yeah. much that thank you, thank you, thank you for... Very nice talk. Any role of starting uh, patients of early and so, PDR yeah, and topical? Right. I, am, I, am, I am coming to that. So this question is, uh, again, not related to this talk. So they say there's a patient of NPDR, early mild or moderate NPDR, mild to moderate NPDR. Should we start on nepafinac oh, or topical oh. steroids? There oh. already studies there regarding the anal 6 uh, especially aspirin, and it has proved to be ineffective. There's no role. So, so uh, no role. who asked this question? Let me see. Uh, this is uh, Charul. Yeah. Charul. Charul, Charul, there's no, I do not uh, recommend and none of us recommend this, that yes. uh, NPDR, you should start on Nepafinac whatsoever because you, you know, ultimately the essence of this talk also was that most of us derive, uh, you know, all this algorithm based on randomized controlled clinical trials. And I do know, I'm not aware of any trial where Nepafinac has been tried and has shown effective in NPDR. So there may be maybe some anecdotal reports here and there, but I don't think so. There's any conclusive evidence that topical NSAIDs should be used in these patients of uh, NPDR. Kim, is that uh, correct? Yes, sir. I agree. Absolutely. So I think uh, uh, we have covered a lot on this. Uh, now that Santosh has appeared on the screen, so my tentacles are high that... Uh, no, because Kim, we normally adhere to this time. Adhere to this time of one hour. Nine and uh, we, we honor we this. Uh, so much delayed. No, no. Still, you see. But I would uh, thank Dr. Kim on behalf of the entire CFS team. 
that uh, you see the way the lucid way he has and the way he has answered all these questions very patiently because there are so many questions here and therefore i had to take special permission from rolika that we may be permitted but let me you know uh, summarize couple of things which uh, even at the cost of repetition is the last chart which came showed all of you should you know go to the youtube and copy that chart and memorize it and couple of uh, you know studies which came said uh, drcr uh, net protocol i protocol t protocol t is first study where they compared all the three drugs available so that you should you see uh, master the protocol t other protocols whether you remember not protocol t you can't afford to miss at all at all as steroids is only tell other thing which all of you should remember is the biomarkers you see which patient like out of all the biomarkers the drill and the hrf they assume the most important uh, you know biomarker apart from other things and also remember what is listing table tractional first question is tractional versus non tractional in non tractional center involved dme we start with pharmacotherapy pharmacotherapy means starting with anti vegf then steroids and sometimes we add uh, lasers later on but what is very important to realize in this talk is laser when you know we were residents at rp center laser laser and laser was the mainstay so kim very nicely showed that but he very conveniently cut that line horizontally the laser ka role has diminished quite a bit as laser is not dead today but still the role has been overcome by availability of this good pharmacological agents and there are huge number of trials uh, you know available on dm other thing which all of you should know is farcimab which has recently couple of uh, months back only Uh, which is by the name of Webismo, Webismo, Webismo by Roche Company has been approved for the management of DME. The advantage of uh, this uh, Farsimab and Rolosimab, which also is going, likely to get approved very fast, is is uh, the long duration of action. Something like Q10 to Q12 or Q16 also Farsimab is claiming. That also should be remembered. I think with these few, uh, you know, uh, summary points, we once again thank uh, Dr. Kim. One one question, Lalit, uh, is uh, Kim, you have not covered the role of uh, surgery in diabetic macular edema. Though no, he, next uh, no. session is on uh, uh, surgical interventions. And the PDF, I, I, that is mainly no. PDS. Ajit, last slide he did emphasize about the tractional component. I know red side pe lal do likhe hote hai. No, no, the, 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 yeah, yeah, so yeah. role of surgery, he said, in such patients in uh, uh, center involving tractional macular edema, he had red lines. Two boxes were made there. And tractional is definite indication, but uh, yeah. there are indications for diabetic macular edema. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. want his views on that. I think he is. Do any treatment? Sometimes we have tried using uh, other than that only for tractional diabetic macular edema. I would. I would think of doing a, a, you know, doing a surgical intervention. So I think with these words, uh, we thank uh, Santosh Nava, Rolika, and this uh, ten, uh, you know, Deepthi also ten, uh, yeah, Deepthi, yeah. So whole team, the <laughs> team, no. अब मुझे बोलने नहीं दे रहे तुम तो so so we thank the entire team uh, hot seats because. i get lot of energy by seeing hot seat people asking questions you see if they ask questions at least uh, my mission is fulfilled and uh, the purpose of having kim here is uh, fulfilled because he answered all of them very nicely we think uh, with this uh, we thank you kim once again and over to you satosh and rolika i really want to thank all of you for this this opportunity is really enjoyed preparing this and also sharing this i mean amazing the questions us. that come from the pgs it's really amazing yeah and of honor for us also santosh and team have done stimulating yeah. them to ask these questions amazing great job congratulations to the entire team yeah. thank you so much sir thank you lalit sir and thank you ajit sir for uh, joining us and taking the discussion it was really kind of you to take out your time for the session sir and well, uh, I, i i took your uh, this thing uh, space primarily because number of portion were too many and i had to finish all of them and get summary out of dr kim that is the reason i, I, I still have to, questions i took up that challenge yeah you still, I have, still questions? have questions from youtube and facebook but uh, i think we're short on time and uh, i should go ahead yeah i think uh, 
we we can write to kim and maybe he can answer and maybe we can put it yes. yeah. sure sir kim i think will be uh, ready to answer those questions yeah yeah and i must say that the post graduate should note that uh, a, a note on diabetic macular edema can be a part of your diabetic retinopathy question as well so yes. make sure that you take it down well and our next few sessions will be on diabetic retinopathy and that is on february 25th we will have proliferative diabetic retinopathy management and approach by dr pramod bhende sir so uh, we'll see you all there thank you thank okay. you kim thank you santosh nolika deepthi and so all the outside participants thank you ajit good night